You are tuned in to Hawthorne University's Holistic Health and Nutrition webinar series, and I want to thank you so much for joining us as we welcome my dear colleagues, Dr. Liz Lipsky and Dr. Bianca Grilli, for this uniquely special webinar, Calm in the Midst of a Storm, How to Center. We truly hope that you're doing well and staying healthy in these uncertain times, and we came together today to be able to offer you our collective compassionate guidance and support for us all. We want to be able to explore ways to embrace holistic lifestyle and nutrition options in order to optimize health in ways that support our immune and respiratory systems, but most especially our mental and emotional health during this challenging time. So let me share a little bit of who's with me today. Dr. Liz Lipsky holds a doctorate in clinical nutrition and is currently the director of academic development for the nutrition programs at Maryland University at Integrative Health. She's the author of Digestive Wellness, now in its fifth new edition, and the founder of Innovative Healing Academy. And she's one of the most calm people I know. <laughs> Pretty calm. Dr. Dr. Bianca Grilli is a former U.S. Marine turned naturopathic doctor with a private practice in Northern California. In addition to patient care, Dr. Grilli consults with natural and functional medicine organizations, including Institute for Functional Medicine, Metagenics, and Hawthorne University on a variety of initiatives such as military veterans healthcare, functional and naturopathic medicine education, and medical affairs. And she's one of the toughest and sweetest people I know. And I get to introduce myself, I guess. I'm Paula Bartholomew, and I've been actively engaged in working in this holistic health field since 1980, attending to body, mind, spirit with my clinical and accumulated skills in meditation, yoga, breath work, clinical nutrition, food preparation, lifestyle, and counseling and education, too. So I'm also your host today, as well as one of the founders of Hawthorne. So with all that said, welcome. Dr. Liskey, welcome, Dr. Grilly. So grateful that you're here with us today. Thank you, Paula. I'm hoping, you know, to, to hear your unique insights and your experiences, and I'm hoping to hear from everyone else, too. We're going to record this presentation. It'll be available for replay on our website in just a few days. We'll likely go over 60 minutes with this, and we'll have time for question and answers, but I really want you to write your questions and comments into the question panel at any time, and please contribute your ideas, your experiences, and your suggestions, too. This is an open chair, and we can collectively learn from each other so much. Okay. Bianca, Liz, are you ready to begin? Yeah, Bianca disappeared. That I, yeah, I'm not sure what I'm doing with this whole uh, webcam, Dr. Lipsky and Paula, but we'll get there. As long as you can see my screen with the, the slideshow, can you all see that? Yes, that's what matters most. Right. It is. It is absolutely what matters most. I'm going to try to figure out how to show myself again, but somehow something happened. and um, Hey, somehow something happened, out. and we will somehow adapt, right? <laughs> That's right. So don't stress about that. Let's just welcome everybody and proceed. Well, you know, it's actually um, a really perfect segue with not being able to see part of the screen and seeing other parts of the screen and having to adapt. Um, going back to, to our Marine Corps training, in my Marine Corps training, one of the um, one of the things we said quite a bit was Semper Gumby, which is always flexible. So you just roll with punches, you figure it out as you go. And I think that's kind of, it, it kind of segues into where we all are in this day right now with COVID-19 and pandemic. And I think that's really where we wanted to talk a lot today about is, is how do we calm ourselves and how do we center ourselves in the midst of this storm that we did not see coming? I mean, for the most part, I think, you know, October, November, December, we were all going about our normal lives and um, not anticipating that we would be either homeschooling or working from home or a combination of all of these different things um, at this point in 2020. Right. So let's see if we can get this going. I did want to um, make sure that we had a disclaimer in here. Paula, um, I can read through this or we can make sure that people understand this is not meant to offer medical advice um, on what's happening in the larger world right now in terms of health. 
Uh, more it's about how to, like I said, center and calm and, and keep ourselves balanced throughout all of this. So if you do have any medical issues, you are, it, it is definitely recommended that you see your healthcare provider rather than utilize this information for healthcare advice solely. Thank you for this. Absolutely. And I'm going to just keep talking here because I wanted to show you my tree. I, I, I told Paula <laughs> and Dr. Lipsky, we just moved into a new place. We actually closed on our house the day that we went into uh, lockdown here in California. And so we've been very blessed that we have um, some property now that my kids are able to go outside and enjoy. And this is one of the most amazing oak trees in our backyard. And I just, it, to me, the oak tree and, and trees in general, when you look at nature, they are the epitome of calm and centeredness and just mm -hmm. digging deep. And so I think that you know, what, what Dr. Lipsky and, and Paul and myself have put together here today will hopefully help all of us to go internally and go deep into what we intuitively know in terms of how to be calm, centered, and to move forward in this, in this big storm that we're, we have going. So the areas we're going to speak about today, really looking at lifestyle and what can you do on an everyday basis within your own household, for your family. Um, we, we have control over a lot of things. Some of these you may not have control over in terms of the limited resources that might be available to you right now in this, in this time frame. But for the most part, we're really looking at how can we utilize nutrition, movement, sleep, resiliency, or, or stress modification, um, and the connection that we all need to be able to get through this. So I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Lipsky for these amazing pictures and can't wait to hear about this. Well, these are just, I like to take pictures of food. It's one of the ways that I rest and relax. And so here's just some pictures of some food that I made for some different meals, a salad and a simple stir fry. And, you know, for me, cooking is self-nurture. Um, I also do have that kind of sense of, oh my gosh, it's five o'clock and uh, what are we going to have for dinner? Because I'm probably the one pulling that together. Um, so, but you know, cooking is self-love and right now is such a great time to pull out those cookbooks, go online, use your imagination and think about what you'd like to cook because um, this is very much a time for us to focus on eating well, and vegetables are really one of the core pieces of this eating well. Every time we get more research about, about the power of eating vegetables and some fruits and fresh food, we find that it makes us live longer, it, it reduces cancer rates by 25% if you just get about seven servings of vegetables and fruits a day. Um, and uh, it lowers uh, heart, heart attacks and strokes by over 40%. So, you know, start thinking about that this is one of the most basic things that we can do to support our immune system is to really be eating high quality food. Um, I love junk food, but this is not really the moment in time to be baking cookies every day or making cakes because sugar can kind of depress our immune system and we want to focus on the really great foods. And Bianca, I think you have a, a slide right after this one. Kind of elaborates on all of this. Yeah, let's look at that. And one of the things, um, Dr. Lipsky, I was thinking about when we were th talking about food a couple of days ago is how food can also help us to go down into that root chakra. If we think about some of the uh, root foods, uh, whether they be beets or carrots or turnips, um, those things I think really help solidify our base. So we've, in our house, we've been doing a lot of, I know that they're, they're, you know, higher in carbs and whatnot, but they're actually very nourishing, I, I think you would agree, but also they, they give you this comfort when you have that, you know, that whether it's a sweet potato or potato or the beets and the carrots, and, and they smell so good when they're cooking too. Um, so I think between looking at the, the, the energetics of the food and then the colors, and Dr. Deanna uh, Minnick speaks a lot about the colors of the rainbow and eating, as you were saying, Liz, a, a wide variety and a large number of vegetables, uh, particularly vegetables and fruits every day. I think it's really powerful if we um, spread it out of the different um, types of foods, whether they be root vegetables or the flowers of, of different foods, and then also the coloring 
um, amongst us. And I think when we do that, we end up following these quote unquote rules of eating, right? Which is have 25 to 35 grams of, of fiber a day, looking at whole grains and legumes and nuts and seeds. Um, and, and it's almost like if you start to eat intuitively, you follow these guidelines of healthy eating. Would, would you, what would, would you feel that way, uh, Liz? Does that make sense of, of how I'm trying to explain it there? Yeah. You know, I mean, there are some days that I feel like having a huge salad. And then there are some days I feel like I don't really want to eat a lot of salad, but I would love to have a baked potato and some steamed broccoli. Um, so kind of listening to what your body is, is tuning into. I can remember going grocery shopping, which I'm not doing right now, but I'm sending my husband, but you know, I can remember like, I'll sit and I'll smell the food and I'll go, oh, is that something that I want to eat right now? And that's kind of part of my intuitive eating of, um, and then there's also the other part of intuitive eating, which is, oh, this is what's in my refrigerator and pantry. What can I make out of that? And using kind of creative thinking to do that. I think, you know, for most people, the average person's eating well more than half of their food is highly processed food every day. And this is an opportunity for a reset to eat more foods in their original state. So just having a big bowl of fruit on the counter, your kids are gonna walk by it and they're gonna grab a piece of fruit. Or, um, or having a bowl of almonds with raisins your kids are going to reach for that because it's just sitting there or a bowl of peanuts and they'll fill up on that rather than uh, food that's less nutrient dense. I think you're so right, Liz, and I have to give you a quick example of that um, in our household just this morning. So yesterday we, or this past weekend, we made some bread. So yesterday we, we ate a little bit more bread than we probably should have. And my son this morning got up and he goes, I need something that's like, it's got like water in it. So he felt the need to have an orange or I, I can't remember what he reached for, a strawberry, something, but it's something that was more juicier and had that nutritional profile. And so I agree with you. You know, if you can teach intuitive eating if you just do it on an everyday basis and you talk to your kids or your family members about it, it becomes natural. It becomes where the kids say, I feel like I need, I need something green. You know, my, my, my daughter says that now she's 16. She'll say, I just need a salad. And you realize that if you, if you just encourage that type of eating along the way over the years, you can teach the science behind it and you can teach the rationale behind it. But if they get that feeling for it, then, you know, the hope is, as you said, Liz, when they open the fridge and they see what's available to them and then they listen into their bodies, they'll know what to reach for and how to create the mixtures that, that bring together all of these, again, guidelines or rules, and they just do it intuitively. I think that's so lovely, and I really appreciate that um, having healthy foods on hand, that those are the choices available, will lead us to those deeper, um, healthier instincts for the, for the choo foods that we want to choose. And, uh, you know, there's so many different diets out there. There's the government guidelines for sure. Here's our 20 to 35 grams of, of fiber coming right from that. But at Hawthorne, we're teaching personalized nutrition, and I really encourage what we're, what Dr. Grilly and Bianca um, and Liz are saying here is to personalize your food intake that really suits you, especially at this time. I also really want to point out the spices and herbs. They're so important. When we think about herbs and spices, and I have like some cayenne here, and I have some sage, which I'll talk about in a little in a while, I've got a little bit of fresh ginger right here. When you think about herbs and spices, they're very, very pungent, which is why we just use little tiny bits. And when we think about food as medicine, these herbs and spices really are medicinal and they have antimicrobial substances in them and they support immune function. Um, they support digestion to make us be able to digest the food more easily and they make the food more delicious. So we win on every level when we think about using herbs and spices. 
the, I, the spices and herbs are so amazing, aren't they? And and we can actually grow a lot of these on our porches if we're in an apartment or if we're in a larger space, we might be able to put them in a garden. And then on top of that, Liz, like I, I believe I haven't seen your garden. I hope someday I get to see more pictures of it. But um, it sounds like you have a, an amazing garden, and I would imagine there's some uh, there's an a, there's a therapeutic component of you going out to snip a piece of base or some basil or get a, a, a sprig of rosemary for your dinner that night. There's there's an additional depth to the therapeutic process in that. There is. Um, the other night, I I looked and there was this head of butter lettuce that was just perfect. And so I, I kind of sliced it off and my 34 year old son has been living with us during this moment in history. He moved back home and, and he said, you know, there's something so satisfying about the fact that you just picked this from the garden. And I also picked some fresh rosemary and some parsley from the garden and some garlic chives and all of them went into the salad. And there's something really centering for me about nature and just being able to go out and just spend time in the garden even if mostly what I'm doing is weeding um, it, it's it's uh, for me it's my therapy I love that we're talking so much about food and I think if we look from a, a scientific perspective or we look into the literature what we see or even to the to the conventional wisdom of utilizing these foods and, and these spices and herbs particularly as medicine we see that they have a whole profile of being anti-inflammatory they're wonderful antioxidants and then we also know that many of them are antibacterial and antiviral so we look at the antimicrobial pro uh, properties as well and right now we need all of those as you're saying Liz so anything we can do to augment that immune system component through our foods is, is truly phenomenal but as we all know there's going to be some limited resources right there might be either that, that the vitamin C from our from our formulary or from wherever we're ordering it from is out, which it seems like is across the board, or we may not be able to get um, certain foods that we want. So we have to start thinking about how do we augment, you know, do we use other foods to take the place of a food that we can't get right now? And in some cases we might need to use supplements to take the place of certain foods if we're not getting enough. And so we, I know that right now a lot of people are talking about zinc and we're talking about vitamin C and selenium. So in certain cases, we might actually have to reach for some of those supplements. And here, of course, we want to make sure that you, you check in with your healthcare provider before dosing yourself up. But these can also have really um, wonderful therapeutic uh, support, be a very therapeutic support system as well. Um, and then, Liz, to your, to your comment of being outside in, in the garden, I mean, right there, you're getting your vitamin D if it's in the sunlight. So I'm going to move on to the next section just because we've spent a lot of time here although we could probably spend the next 45 minutes on this slide and, and not run out of conversation but um if it's okay i'm going to move on to the next section and we can delve well, into some other topics as well while you're moving to the next oh, sorry, slide um, bianca i just want to add that um how we shop is really important right now it's different you know like dr lispke just said she's having her husband go to the store so liz isn't picking out the food particularly she's counting on her husband to do a good job with that but i'm encouraging people as always to shop the perimeter of the store there's still the best options the healthiest options are the fresh fruits and vegetables and produce that are around the outside of the store and all the boxed things are in the middle our farmers markets are starting to emerge again and that's the place to get the freshest food possible is direct from the farmer. Um, so I think there, we'll have a video later in the resources that talk about shopping and preparing and storing our food during the particular time that we're in right now with the pandemic. And so we'll get to that as well. But I'm encouraging people that when you're prepping, prep more than one meal. If you're going to make a soup, make a big batch of soup and freeze it so that you're expanding the amount that you're getting out of each cooking experience. All right, Bianca. Okay. That's a great idea. So this is, uh, I believe this is your slide to um, jump into, Liz. So, you know, we, we started talking about this already, but this is, um, I just kind of went through my kitchen and I started taking pictures of things. So we know honey, for example, if you get raw local honey, 
it has like 14 different strains of lactobacilli and bifidobacteria in it. I've already talked about herbs and spices. These, um, uh, ginger, ginger is great for, for reducing inflammation. It has antimicrobial properties. Um, every day when I make my smoothie, I take like a hunk of ginger. And I also take a hunk of fresh turmeric, um, which looks like ginger, except it's much more orange. I take that and I take some cinnamon and some berries and I take some kale and I throw them all in a smoothie so that when I'm starting my day, I'm starting with something that's really nutrient dense. Um, with a, I use a rice-based protein powder. You can use whatever you like. And, and um, what I love to do is just kind of start my day with this kind of um, drink. As my husband says, it tastes like it's good for you. But for me, I really love having that kind of um, intense flavor. And so think about what you have in your kitchen. What makes you feel robust after you eat it? And you feel like, yes, I feel energized. Because we know that you can feel like not as good um, from eating certain things as well. And, you know, I have the vinegar there, too. Vinegar is very alkalizing. And um, in times of stress, we tend to have, um, we produce a lot of by uh, uh, biological byproducts that are very acidic. And so eating, um, having a little bit of lemon in your water or putting a little of, of lemon or vinegar in tea or cooking with vinegar or lemon, it just kind of helps us stay more alkalized. And when we think about kind of acid rain and what it can do to a, a forest, when you think that your cells are acidic, they also don't work as well and they're not gonna protect you as well. And that's pretty much what I wanted to say about this slide. Liz, are you um, thinking about, um, gosh, I just lost my thought, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to, to share something that one of the attendees just wrote, that she just completed a three-day detox fruit and vegetable smoothie cleanse. She did it with the fa whole family, said it was a great time to, to do it and to take a break from the cooking. And so it plays right in there to, to your morning smoothie drink, Liz. I love that. Yeah, I, want, I want Liz's recipe. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds Close wonderful. It. All right. Not everybody likes it, I have to say. <laughs> well, like you said, it tastes healthy, so you have to you have to like healthy, right? You do. <laughs> so I, I just jumped into the next slide here, and this actually now goes a little bit more in depth into the, the, the actual science behind the nutrients that Liz and I are talking about that come from your food and from your lifestyle choices. And for instance, for instance, here we're looking at vitamin D. And vitamin D has actually um, come to the forefront quite a bit during these last few weeks to a month or so in terms of supporting the immune system. And that makes a lot of sense right now as we know that, uh, you know, we're in the winter for the most part here in um, the Northern Hemisphere. So we're, we're looking at how, how, how good are our levels, our internal levels right now of vitamin D? And do we actually need to supplement or can we get in the sunshine? I think um, flipping it that to the other side is how many of us actually can't get out as much right now because of some of the restrictions that we have in our particular areas. So it's really important, if possible, always to, to take a look at the testing, if that's available to you. Um, in many cases, your healthcare provider might just say, you know, to, to prevent any issues, here's what you'll do from fall to spring in terms of a, a, a typical dosing. But for the most part, we just really need to make sure that we are getting that very critical uh, vitamin D into to our system, particularly for immune health. Bianca, I'll add to that that for people that um, are more restricted, has have less limited space to to move out to into the sun. I'm encouraging people to open their windows uh, in the sunniest part of the day and get sun that way. You don't have to go outside and, and and engage with anybody else. It's all yours in the sun, and it's a great way to take it in and start absorbing it. Oh, I love that. I, I you just brought up a a picture in my mind. Um, of my daughter yesterday, I walked into her room and she's on uh, the west side of the house. 
and so the sun was starting to come into her bedroom through the windows and she was just laid out flat on the floor and she's like I love my room during this time of the day (laughs) so again it's just kind of the intuitive piece of us right our our natural instinct to to get out with the sun wherever that might be so a a point one of the um, attendees is bringing up a a Hawthorne graduate actually that there's an inexpensive finger prick vitamin D test now have Mm -hmm. either of you used this um, I have not. I usually go through a lab, a, a blood draw. And there's another question on vitamin D. Should you increase it if you live in a polluted city? You know, I don't. I don't have an answer to that. Do you, Liz? Um, I like mm-hmm. I said, I typically go based on on testing or just knowing my patients and what happens to them throughout the year. Um, if I've been working with them for quite some time. I haven't seen any research on air pollution and vitamin D. Um, That doesn't mean there isn't any, I just haven't seen any. But what I do know that taking up to 2000 units a day of of, uh, vitamin D3 is pretty safe for almost everybody. And um, doses higher than that, I would do that. Uh, I would take a look at at serum levels of 25 OHD. Um, I think it'd be an interesting study, wouldn't it? To test levels of people in a a highly polluted area versus somebody in in much less of it and see what vitamin D levels of it, if it translates across the board. But to me, it would make sense that if you've got less sunlight streaming in because of pollution in the skies, that you wouldn't be absorbing as much or have access to as much. But that's a speculation. Yeah, I agree. I was going to say it might also, you know, to piggyback on that, Paula, it may even be that in polluted areas, people don't go out as much. Mm. Interesting. So one of Mm. one of the things uh, there's a lot about vitamin D, and lately I've been I've always been really curious about the way that we measure vitamin D because we're not measuring active, the active hormone of vitamin D, which is 125 cholecalciferol. What we're measuring is the pre-vitamin D. And when you measure both, sometimes you find somebody has plenty of vitamin D, but the reason why we don't measure true vitamin D is because it fluctuates um, quite a lot. And for me, the story is, are we really all vitamin D insufficient? Um, I've been reading some reviews from Dr. Alan Gaby lately, and he, he's kind of pointed out these mega reviews showing that, that, you know, getting vitamin D levels up high, which is what most of us, you know, like I like to keep my 25 OHD levels between, you know, um, 50 and 60 somewhere um, for people who have autoimmune disease. Often people will recommend taking it anywhere from 50 to 80. Um, And he, I've been looking at some of the review papers and reading his reviews and we're not finding uh, the collective benefits from everybody getting their vitamin D levels higher than, you know, 35 or so. And so, you know, whereas we have some papers that show that demonstrate 50% reduction in breast cancer rates in women whose levels are 50, and we see a 60% reduction in breast cancer rates in women who have levels of 60 um, nanograms per deciliter. What what we see in kind of the big lumped together studies on cancer is that we're not finding great benefits from from uh, raising vitamin D levels above what's considered to just be the lower levels of normal. So I, for me personally, I have a lot of questions about vitamin D, but that doesn't stop me from taking vitamin D every day in the fall, winter, and spring, and then stopping it in the summer when I'm in outdoors more. So um, I just want to throw that out there. It's always seemed to me like the testing is very much like the old joke about the guy who loses his keys and he's looking under the, the street <laughs> light 
because, and then people are trying to help him and say, well, where did you lose your keys? And he said, well, I lost them over there, but the light's better here. And that's how I feel about this vitamin D right now. And I wish that we had a, a more accurate way of testing it. Well, that's interesting, Liz. I'd, I'd love to read more about that because it does seem like the more we know, the less we know, right? It, it just, if we build and we build and we think we know something and then it's all turned on its head uh, because there's so many facets to, to the human body and how we work. And, uh, you know, the other part for vitamin D that I, I haven't done a lot of, of um, research on, but I know that there's also the, uh, the, the vitamin D receptor, the genetics of it that also impact whether somebody is, uh, whether they're supplementing and whether it's actually something that they can utilize within their body. I think it's very important. There's um, several vitamin D receptors. And if you have um, impaired enzymes on those, you're not going to be able to make your own vitamin D very well. And so uh, I think the first person I ever heard speak about that was Dr. Joe Pizzorno when he was talking about his wife, Laura, and um, she was taking 5,000 units of vitamin D a day and still couldn't get her levels up. And they checked her genetics and she had impaired utilization of vitamin D and she needed 10,000 units a day to bring up her vitamin D levels. So, you know, again, this kind of personalized approach is so important um, for all of us, but, you know, again, we could spend like another hour talking about vitamin D, but I think we need to move on. The vitamin C. Vitamin C. We're just going right through these. So this is a slide that um, that I pulled from Metagenics, and they are looking at some of the different foods and also supplementation associated with vitamin D. Of course, we're talking about the immune system, how we support our immune system in, in uh, this time of, of the pandemic. And so for one of those pieces, we definitely want to look at an antioxidant component of vitamin C. Um, there's a lot of other things that it's doing as well. It's, uh, it's iron, it helps with iron absorption. And there's been some interesting literature coming out, or not even literature, maybe just more hypotheses at this time, as well as some of the research that's coming out of some of the different countries on the, um, the heme and iron piece uh, of of this pandemic and this virus. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. But for again, in most cases, we really just want to focus in on the foods first. And then if we're looking at supplementation, we can start to look at um, vitamin C supplementation, whether it's powder form, capsule form, et cetera. But there are so many phenomenal foods with, with, with um, vitamin C that we can utilize. And we can use these in any meal, whether it's uh, you know, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or, or a snack. So, anything else here, ladies? I'm, I'm just curious. It's important. I'm, the food. I'm just. I'm curious how, if people are taking vitamin C, like how much are you taking right now? I personally am taking three or four grams a day. I usually take two grams a day. So I've seen a couple of different recommendations, and it, it definitely varies depending on who you're speaking with and who's making the recommendations. I've seen anywhere, like you're saying, Liz, between one and maybe up to four or five. But with always always the caveat, right, to, to, to um, bowel tolerance. So yes, too much vitamin C yeah. will give you diarrhea. That, that, yeah, you'll know when you're, at, when you're at your tolerance level right there. <clears throat> but I think the importance is go for your food first. Look at how much vitamin C you're getting from your food and then supplement up after that. I suggest. Yeah, and I would say if you have a, you know, if you're, if you know that your immune system is not adequate and you get every cold and flu that comes around, you really want to be looking a little bit more along the supplementation lines in addition to your food. Whereas if you are, you know, you're, you're, salt of the earth and nothing bothers you and nothing knocks you over, then, you know, maybe food and, and maybe a little supplementation as needed. But again, back to the point that both Paul and Liz have made today, which is that personalization of what you're doing, both from a food perspective and supplementation perspective. Shall we move on? Yes. So we got zinc here. So we've talked about vitamin D, we've talked about vitamin C, and now we're looking at zinc. Um, Again, it's been really interesting to watch what's coming out of some of the different countries and, and in the uh, from the hypothesis perspective of what's happening right now. And zinc has also come to the forefront as possibly being something that's either being depleted 
uh, if someone is infected and or maybe we are already low in many cases and um, allowing our immune system to be um, weakened enough that, that the, the virus itself can take hold. Um, many, P I, I've noticed uh, within my patient population, Liz, I'd love to hear from you and, and Paula too, I, I've noticed a lot of my patients are low in zinc. I don't test everyone, but when I get a little um, suspicious that, that there's some, some deficiencies going on, we do test. And I've been surprised at how many people come up um, low levels of zinc. I'm not testing for it specifically. Um, pretty much going by a, a, a diet record and someone's health mm -hmm. status. If they're not eating any foods with zinc and they're not feeling very well, I'm going to suggest that they have some more foods with zinc and, and possibly get tested then. One of the great things about foods that are high in zinc is that they're also high in protein generally. And um, those two things, those two nutrients really go together for, for um, supporting immune function. We can't forget about eating protein because it, it's so important for muscle and brain and just overall health. Um, you know, one of the ways that you can kind of down and dirty see if you need extra zinc is um, you get little white dots in your fingernails um, is one of the little signs that you might need more zinc or little that white specks get bliss? Is that little right? white specks in your nails yeah and um, there's also kind of a taste test that you can use that's a zinc sulfate that you can swish around in your mouth and see and in general, most people, it tastes like water. And uh, it's actually supposed to taste kind of like, ew. And so you can use that as a down and dirty zinc test. Um, um, and a lot of the different supplement companies make that. And when I was in practice, I used to just always keep a bottle on my shelf open. And um, every once in a while, if I was suspicious of zinc, I would um, have someone do it personally. Just as part of my daily routine, I take um, a trace mineral supplement that has a little bit of zinc in it and also has selenium and uh, iodine and manganese and chromium and molybdenum, boron, vanadium, a little bit of silica. And this is just part of my daily routine is that I, I don't take a multivitamin with minerals, but that would do the same thing because they usually do have zinc in them as well as selenium, and both of those, um, both of these minerals are being looked at right now. We know that they're useful for colds and flus. Um, we don't really know much about COVID-19 at the moment um, because we don't have the research. Yep. So we can see that, you know, if we go back to our looking at a whole foods diet, if we have healthy proteins, we have a wide variety of nuts and seeds and beans, um, and we're also looking at fruits and vegetables, we've covered a lot of these nutrients that we just talked about that are so important for immune health, vitamin C and zinc and the selenium. Um, and then if we're getting outdoors as part of that lifestyle piece, we're getting a lot of our vitamin D as well. So it really does, you know, really come full circle again to what are we doing on a daily basis within the confines of what we can do right now. The food that has the most zinc is, is um, oysters by far. You can get, um, from having oysters once in a week, you can get a week's worth of zinc in your, in your diet. And in our house, um, we have little cans of smoked oysters that we get for like $2 from the, from the grocery store. And, um, I eat one of those like once a week, and it's a simple way to get zinc. That's great. That's a great idea. You can probably even throw some of those into your lunchbox or your purse or wherever once we get going out of the house again. So I just jumped over to the next slide, which is probiotics. And probiotics are just a phenomenal component to, to the daily diet for so many different reasons. Here we're looking at gut health. Uh, we know that a, a large per, a component of the immune system is actually located in the gut. And so if we're taking care of our gut, we are by just naturally supporting our immune system. 
So there's so many different ways we can get um, probiotics. We can do it through our diet. We can do it through supplementation. We can even do it through daily living, like being outside in the garden and, and touching things that have some of those microbes on it. So I'm going to jump to the next slide unless you want to get into the science here, Paula and, and uh, Liz. No, I'm just curious what kind of um, what kind of fermented foods are, are people eating? Um, Bianca, you mentioned that you made bread. Um, we don't normally think of that as a fermented or cultured food, but it is. Um, it's a yeast-based mm -hmm. food, and uh, we know that the even baker's yeast has well, it has some mixed benefits, but it, it can have benefits for most people, but not everybody. Um, and I start almost every day with homemade kimchi. Um, I make a cashew coconut kefir. You know, there's a lot of really delicious ferments that you can make at home, or you can just buy yogurt or kefir or sauerkraut um, or olives. You know, these are all fermented foods um, that have been part of our culture for you know, thousands of years. And for me, um, I love probiotic supplements. I've published papers on probiotics. I, I think they're amazing, but it's only in the last maybe 30 years that we even have probiotic supplements, 40 years at the most. And up until now, everybody's gotten these microbes from food. So moving back to kind of uh, cultured and fermented foods. And then as this slide says, the prebiotics are, are the colors in food, the soluble fibers in food, um, the, the polyunsaturated fats in food. So when we eat nuts and seeds, they have prebiotics and they also have um, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And all of these are prebiotics that help us to feed the microbes in our gut so that they're strong and healthy. I love this picture and, and someday I'm going to replicate this picture of these fermented foods in, in my kitchen. I swear it, I just think it's so colorful and it, it just, for me, it shows life. Um, and what I wanted to throw into that mix, Liz, is getting in the garden. So again, if you have access to the dirt and the soil or, or anything that you, you're doing right now in your own home space, is when you pick some of those fresh fruits or vegetables out of your garden, it, just naturally there will be some of these microbes on uh, residually on, on the food. And so by eating locally, as Paula was saying, the farmer's markets, when they, when they come back on, um, come back in and allowed to, to work again, we can cultivate that gut microbiome through just using local and even homegrown foods as well as the foods that we eat on an everyday basis that are in this first list. And then as Liz was saying, the foods that will feed those probiotics on that second list. So did you ask, you asked the question, um, Liz, which was what, what is everybody else doing for mm -hmm. their fermented foods? And I look at this list and we're, we're doing quite a few in our house. Um, I do want to make sauerkraut, and it sounds like you've got some stuff. I'm looking at your book right now on my shelf, Digestive Wellness, and I'm wondering if you hid any of those um, recipes in that book. So I'm going to have to go look through that again. I didn't, but I have them in my new course. That's oh, good. Yeah. Well, okay, good. <laughs> some, of, some of our um, attendees are saying kimchi and coconut yogurt and multiple times sauerkraut. Yeah, it's Great. definitely going to be dinner time right after this with all the food talk that we're doing here. <laughs> exactly. You know, I missed a number of questions on the nutrients, so we'll come back to that as we're wrapping up this section. Okay. So we're, we're getting now into some of the, the adaptogenic uh, foods and herbs that can actually be used not to just support our stress response, but also because we're supporting the stress response, we are also supporting the immune system. So there's a couple of here that are noted. One is AMLA and the, and the other is Andrographis. And there's some papers here if you want to read up on that. Um, but again, the, the AMLA itself, uh, not only does it show natural killer cell activity, but also that it has quite a bit of vitamin C um, in its fruit. So it's, it's doing so many different things. And, and it, when you eat a whole foods diet or you eat a whole food in and of itself, there's, there's probably, I can't even guess, hundreds of different actions and, and properties that are happening within the body 
um, that support different systems um, for health. This is another slide pulling out some of the Asian mushrooms and again how we're supporting the, the stress component or the, the adrenal glands which also then support that immune and respiratory health. And so you can see if you're using some of these in your foods, that's fantastic. You can see how that they, how they are supporting either the respiratory tract, the immune uh, system, or even as a stress and energetic component. Um, or if you're taking them as supplements as well. So there's a, there's a couple different methods to, to utilizing them and many different opportunities to utilize them. Love the re the reishi mushroom. I, I often put it in my tea blends. And a um, friend of mine is a mushroom grower, and I wish I'd had brought one in for a for a show and tell because it's like a big antler. It's like a big furry, thick antler, you know, from a giant <laughs> creature like an elk. And it's amazing to grind up and put in. Um, but, you know, shiitakes are regular um, in, in my meal plans always. And my goddaughter right now is growing both lion's mane and shiitake mushrooms in her windowsill with inoculated little logs and posting fabulous meals <laughs> she's cooking with them. So lots of potential here wow. with the mushrooms, using them in different ways. You know, there's so many things that we can utilize this time for right now when we're homebound and trying to sort out all of the chaos and the confusion and, and all of the stress that's happening. And I think if we go back to the original intent of this webinar, which is the calm and center and, and rebalance, we can actually find that there's a lot of things that we can do and learn during this time period that will serve us so well later, such as your, your goddaughter. I mean, I would have never thought of growing mushrooms in my windowsill, but what a great idea and what a great opportunity to, to do that right now. I know, and they're so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. Quercetin, um, I'm, I'm going to ask a quick question here uh, because of our, our time check. Uh, Paula, do you want us to go into each slide or, or do you want us to get into some of the other pieces beyond nutrition here? Well, let's finish up the, this, this slide with Quercetin briefly. I'll go through you some bet. questions that came in and um, talk about one other piece that I think is key here. But yes, Great. I want to get to the heart of this, which is managing our stress. Great. So we know that Quercetin is a phenomenal antioxidant. Um, and in this particular slide, we're looking at it in support of um, the lung, the, uh, the lungs, the tissues, um, also the immune system and actually as an antiviral component. So quercetin foods are also quite ubiquitous. We're looking at the green vegetables, broccoli, red onions, peppers. And in fact, a lot of the foods that we think about with quercetin, to me anyway, I also think about in conjunction with vitamin C. Um, but then we also have uh, some of the tannins and, and other foods here, black tea, green tea, and, and red wine. So um, Liz, do you have anything on here? I'm yeah, you know, quercetin is one of my favorite nutrients, and it's in my little bucket of things. I use one called Pain Guard by Perk because it's um, a combination of of uh, quercetin dihydrate and grapeseed extract. And just for me personally, I have nothing to do with this company, but for me personally, this particular supplement has been a life changer. Quercetin is a mast cell inhibitor. So it's one of our most beneficial substances that we can take for allergies, runny nose, post-nasal drip, um, hives. Um, I, I cannot tell you when I was in practice how many people would come into my office and they said, I have hives. I said, do you have them right now? And I give them a one of these and we check in 20 minutes and their hives would be gone. Um, for me, I get, when I get a cold, I get a lot of post-nasal drip and then I cough and cough and cough. And this really, um, it's kind of like taking uh, NyQuil, you know, it just kind of dries everything up in a very natural way. And um, my daughter-in-law, just the other day, she said, oh, I took one of those that you gave me last year and my nose cleared up in 30 minutes from the allergies. So quercetin is being looked at. It has been 
beneficial for colds and flus of other types. And um, it's often on the list from uh, reputable sources as one of the one of the supplements that people may want to consider having some around. Especially right now, as you're saying, Liz, with the allergy season coming up, um, this will be super beneficial. Yeah, and not all brands of quercetin work as well. So if you get one and it doesn't work well for you, try a different one. Here. Oh, this is Liz's favorite supplements for immune support. He's taken okay. us through a couple of these. What are the others? Okay, so I'm very serious about when I start to get sick, um, I don't want to get sick. So I, there are things that I do almost immediately. So the first thing, and you can see how serious I got two different brands of this. This is Yin Chow, and Yin Chow is a Chinese... Um, remedy is Chinese uh, traditional cold remedy for at the very first signs of getting a cold, you start taking some yin chow with a hot beverage um, and you do that every two to six hours. And sometimes if you're lucky, along with some extra vitamin C, it'll push your cold away. The other thing that I do immediately if I'm coming down with a cold is if I can possibly do it, which doesn't always work, but I take the day off and I read and I sleep and I just, you know, make space in my life because I know that if I can just rest, that my body knows what to do better than if I'm running around like a crazy person. And one of the other things that's up on the screen is a silicosinium, which is a homeopathic, which, um, we have some reasonably good research on demonstrating that taken at the first sign of flu that it can shorten the duration of a flu or the severity of a flu so that's something um you'll also see up on the screen kyolic garlic is such an important antiviral so you know i'll take when i get sick i'll take garlic and i'll put it into my smash i'll smash it and I'll put it in my tea um, along with either some lemon and vinegar. Um, I also, because again, if I really get sick, I like to take sage and, and put that in my tea as well. What I'll do is I'll actually go out in my garden and I'll pick sage or take dried sage, some thyme, some rosemary, um, some fresh ginger, some garlic, um, and, um, and maybe some rubose tea. Um, and and what I'll do is I'll take like a half gallon jug and I will make a great big thing of tea. And then what I also do is cup by cup, I decide how much cayenne pepper I want in it. And I'm not somebody who really loves hot, spicy, but when I get sick, my throat loves this and it just tastes just right. Um, so, you know, making big vats of tea staying really well hydrated, it, it helps. And then I just kind of add all of these different things. Um, I've got two other things on here and that's that I always keep around some peppermint oil or pe this is peppermint spirits. Um, and I also, we always have eucalyptus oil because sometimes my colds, when I was a little kid, they would always end up as a viral bronchitis, which was terrible. And so if I feel like my, my lungs are starting to feel a little heavy, what I do is I boil water and I take a bowl of water and I drop a few drops of peppermint oil and eucalyptus oil in and I put my head over the bowl and I breathe in that steam and I do that for about five minutes, maybe three times a day. And what I'm doing is it's almost like having my own nebulizer. I'm actually getting these herbs right into my lungs where they can have an effect of opening my bronchial passages. And so, you know, I'm giving kind of all the things, like I'm a crazy person when I get sick and I have a million remedies. And I'm sure you also have a lot of self-care that you do. And I would love to hear about some of the self-care. I know some people use andrographis. And um, 
it's not a good supplement for me for some different reasons, but, but um, I'm curious, like what kind of, what, what's your self care look like? Oh, and vitamin C, sometimes I'll just do a whole vitamin C flush. I will use powdered vitamin C and take it every 15 minutes until I am having liquid stools um, because that will help flush out a viral infection as well. So, um, you know, I'm like, a, as I said, a crazy person when I get sick. I have like a million ways of trying to get out of it. And sometimes they work and I have just something really mild. And then sometimes I go deep down into a cold or flu just like anyone else. That's you great, Liz, because I'm listening. Oh, I, I, sorry about that, Paul. I just want to say, Liz, you're, you're targeting the your immune system and the virus or the bacteria or whatever it is you're coming down with uh, from so many fronts. You're, you're using homeopathy from an energetic level. You're looking at your lung health through your sinus or your, through your steam uh, inhalation. You're doing your throat support with your with your tea. Um, you've got your antioxidants at that cellular level with the, the vitamin C. And then you're doing this great self care through taking the day off. I mean, you're you're coming at it on all fronts, and it seems like it's such a powerful combination. Most of the time, it works great, and then more recently, um, I had a really bad cold, and it lasted three weeks. So, yeah, the cold didn't, but the cough did. So, mm -hmm. maybe you had something. Yeah. Last. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't say stuff, that. You know, so. <laughs> I was thinking today, well, did it really help them? I'm going, well, I don't know, but like the last two times I was coming down with something, I didn't get it at all, you know? So, Liz, well, you've mentioned vinegar. Right, you've Paula. mentioned adding vinegar a few times. And are you talking apple cider vinegar? Yeah, I just, you know, get Bragg's or some other version of apples, the raw apple cider vinegar. And I throw that into my tea, you know, at, along with a lemon and um, and the garlic and the ginger and all the herbs. I just, um, I don't know. There's something about that sour. It just feels really good when you're sick. Well, there's a lot of history. There's good good research on apple cider vinegar in, in general too. But as we wrap up this section, is I just want to ask a few questions that came in on the nutrients. So. Um, are there any specific symptoms to point to kinks and enzymatic pathways inhibiting bioavailability for vitamin D? For vitamin D mm. or B? D. D. For vitamin D. So are you talking enzymatic pathways or are you talking genetic pathways? Oh, I was talking genetic. No, genomic. you were. But the question is, is enzymatic. And so... I wonder if it means. I have question. not looked into those. Bianca, have you? I have not. I mean, the only thing I'm thinking about, you know, we have to have some of the conversion happening in different organs. So, you know, if there's there's organ, um, any issues with the organs, the kidneys, the lungs, then, you know, that might, I'm not sure what the exact question is referring to, but it may be that we have to look deeper if we're not getting the response we would typically notice by either giving a higher dose of supplementation of vitamin D and or being out in the sun adequately. Thanks. So it might actually take a deeper dive if, you know, if, if we're not seeing the change we would tend to see with those particular interventions. We had a slew of people tell us how many how much milligrams of vitamin C they were taking it ranged from 1,000 to 500 milligrams a day for a healthcare worker in a hospital setting. Um, the question about um, oh, it comes back to zinc deficiency. If smell and taste is dampened, it, it's an indicator of zinc deficiency. And um, yeah, they reported this in the hospital that she works in a couple months ago too. Yeah, yeah. Been some, I mean, go ahead. You know, we're seeing more and more reports of um, COVID-19 that one of the symptoms is loss of sense of smell and taste as early symptoms. And um, definitely, you know, when you're working with somebody and food no longer tastes good, 
or their sense of smell is really low, you start wondering about zinc sufficiency. Question about zinc. Um, does zinc before bed or away from other megavitamins and foods increase absorption? You know, I have to say that I, I, I know there are certain times in certain cases that we need to take things away from each other. For what I've seen, though, in order to have um, patient follow through is typically I we do it with a meal or we do it in between meals, you know, depending on what they're able to do. And I just think that for, for my patient base anyway, we look at what's best for each patient in terms of their timing, their resources, what they're managing on a daily basis, et cetera. Good. good. I think minerals come from food, and so I like to take things with food. I do too. All the cofactors are right there also. And it's easier. <laughs> Back to quercetin. If broccoli or red onions are cooked, does that damage or decrease the quercetin content? No. I, I, I can't answer that, so I'm going to. So You're, um, I agree with Liz. The, the um, in chow um, Chinese formula you can take, and can you spell that, Liz? Oh, it's spelled lots of different ways. So, Y I N C H I A O, and then the other one that I have is Y I N C H A O, and then Jin J I N, um, and then another spelling is Yin Y I N Q I A O. So Chinese to English, lots of spellings. Thank you. Is there a form of vitamin C that's best absorbed? What we've been using in our household for quite a few years and um, what I typically recommend to my patients is the formula by Metagenics. It's called Ultra Potent C. And I could grab it right now. I think it has uh, a couple of different forms of vitamin C in it. And it just seems to work really well from what I've seen. But um, obviously, there's many different approaches. Yeah, I mean, there's liposomal C that supposedly is absorbed much better. There's also... Um, Dr. Minnick just spoke to that. And she said she did not understand and she hadn't seen research um, to verify that, and she didn't understand it since it's a water-soluble um, yeah. vitamin, so why would you need it in a lipid form to be better absorbed? But that was just a question from a scientist yeah. perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't ever used it because it did, doesn't make sense to me. And then you have um, ascorbates, which are usually chelated with a mineral, um, sodium, calcium, magnesium, zinc. So. Um, you've got them, and then you've got ester C's. So I think uh, ester C or an ascorbate C is better absorbed than an ascorbic acid. Um, you know, or any kind of a buffered C would be a little bit better, but I don't think it makes that much difference. Um, the one that I use is buffered with minerals, so that um, it's just buffered with little bits of minerals as well. So, you know, I don't think it's that critical. Yeah, I do the per the perk buffer too. Liz, um question about the name of the quercetin supplement. That was a perk bone guard, isn't that right? The quercetin? No, it's yeah. called pain guard. P A I N G U A R D. And they also make one, these are five hundred milligrams. Mm -hmm. They also make one called Repair Guard that is a thousand milligrams. And it's um a thousand milligrams of quercetin plus a thousand millig uh, plus plus grapeseed extract plus pomegranate. Um, I like the pain guard because I can control the dose better, and I find 500 milligrams is usually plenty. But she was saying she likes perk vitamin C. It's 99% reduced. Is 99% reduced for more bioavailable? Well, what Dr. Jaffe, who's, who makes PERC, says is that a lot of times when we get vitamin C, it's already starting to go rancid um, because it is such a, uh, it, it can be oxidized so easily. You know, vitamin C has both um, antioxidants and pro-oxidant effects. And so, um, like, sometimes I'll get, like, the PERC C powder 
and um, I'll open it up three months later and it is like solid as a rock and brown because it's oxidized. And so, you know, why they say that it's um, reduced means that it is not uh, going to oxidize on you very easily. Okay, thank you. All right, we can move on. I'll just say you had asked what other people are doing and we got someone is using Epsom salts bath with essential oils. Okay, oh, let's go to that. sleep, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not go to sleep, but move on to sleep. <laughs> that sounds great. So we've really looked at, you know, for the most part, almost an hour here, we've talked about nutrition. And I think that really comes back full circle in that what we're doing on an everyday basis, multiple times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, all of those pieces really are what starts the base of our health. And so during this time where we do have maybe extra time, some of us, maybe not all of us, where we can either source different foods that we've never tried before, or we can cook differently, or we can try new recipes. Um, I've had quite a few people, uh, friends of mine who've said, you know, I'm cooking more than I've ever cooked before. I cannot wait to go out again. But really, this is a time where we can look at the nutritional component of our health. So that's part of our lifestyle base, right? But we know that there's other pieces that we, we can have a huge impact with. And one of those is sleep. So I'm hoping that a lot of us are taking the time to sleep right now and hopefully sleep restfully. However, I know that I talked to Paula, I think it was about a week ago, and she was saying she has some people who are either sleeping a ton or they're not sleeping well at all. And I think it runs the gamut depending on whether this particular situation and, and time in our lives is creating a lot of anxiety where maybe we're not able to sleep so well or maybe it's creating some depression and not feeling well and and just wanting to sleep all the time so it may right. again it's look you know it depends on who you are and how you're feeling and, and what's going on in your life but we do know that sleep is truly a huge factor in our immune system so again we're looking at the immune system we want to strengthen that and we want to make sure we're sleeping well so there's a lot of different ways we can um, focus in on sleep. Uh, it's called sleep hygiene, and most of you have probably heard about it or are hopefully practicing some of this. So I'm just going to take you quickly through these six steps of what we can do to support our sleep cycles and improve sleep so that we improve our immune system. Um, sticking to that sleep schedule, because I know that probably a lot of us right now, maybe we're staying up later than we used to, or we're not getting up as early as we used to, or there's maybe some fluctuation in how we're sleeping. But really take a look at what's happening with the sun right now. What time is the sun going down? What time are you going to bed? How much, um, how many hours of sleep you're getting? What time you're getting up? And really try to create a schedule so that you're doing the same thing every day. Always watch what you're eating and drinking before bed, right? We don't want to have too much to eat um, before we go to sleep, avoiding those carbs and the sugar spikes that we might have if we eat those carbs and sugar right before bed. Um, particularly, this might go towards alcohol. You know, there's people who are drinking more alcohol maybe than usual, and so that can really spike that blood sugar right now. Taking a look at your room, you're spending a lot of time in there. So what does that feel like to you? Is it cool enough for you? Do you have a nice breeze if you like the breeze? Do you have a fan going? How about the noise situation? Again, there's going to be things that are in our control, and we do have to really focus on those. And there's going to be things that are outside of our control right now, and we have to let those go if we can. Limit the daytime nap. I know for some people they love naps. I've never been a napper, so it's hard for me to understand that, but I know it's good for some people, but we don't want to sleep so much during the day that we can't sleep at night. So I think that's really where we want to focus in on that for number four. And then getting outside. So this goes back to that other piece of lifestyle, right, which is movement. So get outside if you can every day. If you can't get outside to move, you can move inside, um, hopefully in your own particular space. So we're looking at there's apps, there's videos, there's all sorts of free things right now to get you moving. So we have to do that in order to support sleep to and to support our overall health uh, during this time frame. And then, you know, all of us are probably going through some form of this or another, which is we're worried, we're anxious, what can we control? When are we going to be able to get back out again? When can we get to work? What's our financial situation? What if you get it? What if he gets it? What if your whole family, you know, it, it just, it, it can be blown huge, or we can pull it back in a little bit and say, okay, what can I control? What can I worry about? What can I do about it? 
-hmm. And I think to a certain extent, we have to find our little bubble of what we can and can't do. And at a certain point, we have to let some of the other go. And so that will go back into how we manage our everyday stress and what we do for that stress modification, whether it be the t ways we're cooking or our supplementation in terms of um, the adaptogens and or what we're doing uh, for breathing exercise and yoga, meditation, prayer, et cetera. So before I jump off this page, anything, um, Paula and Liz? Um, I have a couple thoughts. Uh, I think that it's important to have structure, yes. And I also think this is such an unstructured time and that it's okay to let ourselves be. And if we're feeling really tired in the day and just overwhelmed by the, the what life is presenting right now, it's okay to rest. Our body's really calling for it. So again, it comes back to really listening to ourselves. But I agree very much with this last point. Turn off the news. I'm so grateful that I have never owned a television in my life and adult life and never owned one. My parents owned one when I was a kid. But um, I'm very selective of my news sources and where I get my information. And I'm finding 15 minutes a day is really adequate for me to be very well informed. And that's me co you know, combing through the research also. It's, um, it's important that we don't add things that are stressful. And news can be stressful, especially when it's so magnified. I would agree. Okay, sorry. So that kind of brings us to how we can manage that stress. Um, and as we just spoke about, some of that comes back to relaxation, resiliency, and how do we each, what, what type of program do we each need or what kind of uh, activity support our particular needs and also understanding that that may change between Monday and Wednesday and Friday and then next week, it might all change in terms of what makes you feel good and helping to reduce that stress based on what's happening either in the outside world or even within your own family. We know that just like we talked about, everybody's different. And right now these triggers, they're multifaceted. They come from fear, unknown, financial issues. It could be from boredom, you know, people just being at home for so long but the same people, the same thing, it's, it's, uh, it's the groundhog day, right? But there's also the sensory overload, which speaks to what, what you were saying, Paula, that, that the news pieces can be so overwhelming and they can be so fear-based and anxiety-provoking that sometimes it's better to just know that's going to trigger you or make you feel unwell or, or not happy and just turn it off or not turn it on at all. And this, um, this really spoke to me when I saw it uh, a few weeks ago, and it's about grace. And I think it spoke to me because one of my New Year's resolutions uh, for this year, actually I'm lying, it was for last year, but I'm carrying it over into this year, which is grace. And grace for others, because we don't know what everybody's going through or what their situation is, but also to turn inward and grace for myself. And I know that I've carried a lot over the years. And sometimes you just need to be able to put it down and say, that's okay. So I'm just quickly going to read this. But this probably came out, like I said, uh, maybe two or three weeks ago that I saw it. And it was during this particular pandemic. And so I think it speaks well to the time we're in. A soft reminder as we enter a new week. We, all of us, are currently going through a collective traumatic experience. Trauma is often thought of as too much too fast, which is exactly what's happening. So of course you're exhausted, of course you're afraid, of course you're overwhelmed, of course you're clinging to certainty in the midst of so much unknown, and of course you aren't as productive, feeling foggy or wondering how you can possibly go through so many waves of emotions all in the same day. This all makes so much sense in the context of our circumstances. So be gentle with yourself. Have compassion for your process. Give yourself grace. You are good, no matter how you're managing this completely new experience. And this came from Lisa Oliveira, who is a um, marriage family therapist uh, in the Bay Area. So hopefully this speaks to you as well. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you're, you are doing good. You're doing a really good job. I'm going to hand this over to Liz and Paula. We talked about different ways to reduce our stress on an everyday basis. So, you know, 
for me, it's like I always have to come back to like what is centering for me and what gives me pleasure. So the other day I downloaded a piece of uh, music and I determined that through this time I'm going to learn this to play this on the piano, which I I don't really play piano very often, so it's going to be difficult. But, but you know, it's something that gives me a lot of pleasure when I do play piano, even though I'm so terrible at it now because I don't do it very often. But, but you know, I think about like what gives me pleasure. My husband meditates two hours a day. He's meditating right now, um, morning and evening. Um, he, you know, some people like to. Uh, Pray. Some people like to journal. Some people like to read the Bible or the Quran or something spiritual during the day. Um, I love to read novels at the end of the day. Like I get into bed and I read a novel because I don't want to read any more research. Um, and um, I start my day by doing 15 or 20 minutes of stretching and calisthenics, and then I try to get some kind of exercise in. Sometimes I'll take a Epsom salt and baking soda bath. Um, so it's like, what calms you? What centers you? What fills you and keeps you in a place where you feel like, okay, I've got this center? Um, and one of the other things that's so important for me is connecting with people who I love and care about. And so maybe some of you have noticed that people are calling you or texting you or sending you emails or checking in with you on Facebook, just saying, how are you doing? Um, and I find myself picking up the phone more and calling friends and just going, how is it going? Calling family. So, you know, whatever you can do, um, think about what works for you. There isn't a one size fits all. Hmm. It's a big piece here. Um, so grateful for both of your shares and for the grace piece, Bianca. For me, one of the things that I do and I encourage is on a daily basis is checking in with myself. How am I? And in this activity, I do it with a mirror. And I really look in the mirror and I ask myself, how am I? How am I right now? Um, and then I look deeply in my eyes to know, to be able to see and to be able to listen to how I respond. And then I give myself some loving compassion because sometimes looking in a mirror isn't easy, right? <laughs> but it's, it's a powerful piece to look in your own eyes and see what you see. Another piece I do is um, gratitude regularly. I'll wake with gratitude. And I'll, the last thing before bed is to share gratitude. And I keep a gratitude journal also. It's an interesting time to reflect back on what I've been grateful for in the months prior to what I'm grateful for right now. Um, and the other thing here is prayer. And for me, I was raised a Catholic, and so my prayer has really morphed into something that really serves me at this time. But I appeal to my ancestors a lot right now because they lived through so many things. They lived through really hard times. They lived through perils, and, and my father survived the 1918 flu. His mother did not. He was nine months old when his mother died from the flu. He survived, and I attribute that to his lifelong tremendous immunity. I never knew my father to go to the doctor, ever. So I asked my, my ancestors, you know, how do I survive this? How do I be at this time my best self? All last thing, mm -hmm. There's one last thing is, you know, I'll end my day with a bath. And then I go outside to the night sky. The night sky is just deeply important to me because I feel small in the vastness of it all. And I know that this too will pass. And just what a tremendous opportunity this is right now. What a tremendous opportunity for personal introspection and growth, growth for inner relationship reflections and and clearing of old traumas and pains and forgiveness and sharing together. And then for our planet, I have the greatest hope for our planet right now. We are on the biggest pause 
if we're on a hold button around the world, it's amazing that something silent and invisible stopped us in our tracks completely. And how are we going to reemerge? Yeah, this is a time for a reset, reimagining, reinvention if we're not we're doing or being the way we want to be. And I think it's a, a great opportunity, you know, um, in the Chinese, they say, may you live in interesting times. It's a curse. Well, that's where we are. Um, and we can either have the grace in this time or, or just freak out. And, you know, it's very personal for a lot of us. I have, um, uh my sister and brother-in-law have covid and um they're coming out the other side my brother-in-law's in the hospital so it's not like it's not touching me personally um but how do we be helpful and and remain calm during all that you know this is a test of like how centered we can be true yeah well, Liz, I hope your sister and brother-in-law continue to do well and come out very healthy on the other side through all of this. And I'm sure with your support, they'll be jumping back in with all of the immune support you'll have ready for them. Well, they I sent it to my sister, but my brother-in-law thinks it's all nonsense, so he's not going to do any of that. And, that's and you know, I think that's option. another piece to consider. You know, we, we can only as practitioners or experts in our field, wherever it is that we currently are, all of us in the Hawthorne community and beyond, we can only do what will be accepted by the other person. We can only offer. There's no forcefulness. There's nothing we can do if the other side is not ready to receive. But the knowledge that our community has, I believe is very powerful. And it, <clears throat> it sets the base for that strength and that ability to go deep when these when the storm comes right and that again that goes back to what we're talking about here the calm the centeredness the rebalancing in the face of this storm so i think if we can all come back to what the basics are and that's our lifestyle and how we manage what's happening within our own particular circle that's where we can have the most effect So I'm going to jump into the, I think we have a couple more slides and, and um, these are more, I believe, references and resources. If, if there's anything we want to call out on these slides, just let me know. Oh, is that, that your garden, Liz, the chart? You know, you can't see it as well as it was, but the light was just coming through the chart at this moment. And that's one of the things that I do. I forest bathe with my phone and I take pictures of things that interest me when I'm out for my walks or in my house or whatever. So um, this was one of my lists, play a game, solve a puzzle, plant a garden, even if it's on your windowsill. So I know we're going very long. So let's go to the next slide. Well, before we do, I just want to mention a couple of things that um, people are saying here that, you know, it's like, yeah, spring has come, you know, birds are singing and that they listen to encouraging and uplifting music. And that's another thing that for the last three months, I can't stop adding to my, what I call it, my, my divine playlist. I am listening to, to holy music and it's so moving. It's so, it's so needed. And so I appreciate that. Any encouraging and uplifting music, yes, yes to that. Paula, is there a typo on that link? Is there supposed to be a little period? I, in the um, I, I don't think, you know, it looks like there is, but I checked it. I looked at that too, and I checked it before we went live. I just put that in my browser, and it went right to that. And this is for, uh, this is from um, Sarah Borelli. And um, it's her song, Brave. She's a local, uh, she's from Humboldt County, and so am I. So um, it's a particularly strong song right now for this time. And it's, it's, it really looks like people are really, you know, um, six feet apart when they're dancing and singing. It's an uplifting here, so. All right, on to the other resources. 
Yep, I'm going to skip these two. I, I encourage our listeners to go back to these next couple of slides. There's some exercises for relaxation through breathing, but also we know that this will also support our respiratory tract. So definitely come back to these. Um, I think there's two or three. It looks like three go, slides go, here. Go, go back a minute, um, Bianca. Go back to the first slide there and see next one back that one. The, for this exercise, oh, I just sorry. want that. Uh, uh, deeply relax all your muscles it's like i encourage people to start with their feet and slowly move up through their body so it's not like we're going to relax and go limp all of our muscles at once i mean that would be great if i could accomplish that but it's a slow progressive <laughs> visualization yeah. of your feet and through every part of your body up up through the head okay absolutely you know, these next two, like I said, are to support your lung health, but also they encourage relaxation and redu reducing stress. So definitely take a look at these. And then it looks like Liz and Paula put together some slides for additional uh, websites and resources here. So I'm going to stop on this slide and let you call out what you'd like to. Tara Brock is somebody I've listened to for a number of years now. And... Um, she's very meaningful to me, the way she speaks and how she offers her meditations and her insights. Um, one of the things I've been asking myself right now and asking all of us is, what do I want to accomplish with myself, with this special time? Tara Brock talks about the sacred pause. We're all on a pause right now, big pause button. So what do I want to accomplish? What do you want to accomplish with yourself during the sacred pause? How do I want to live to be after this? And just constantly ask myself, what really matters now? I, I believe, to your point, Paula, that, that many people will make changes after this. I, I truly believe we've been given a time period where we can see, like you said, what matters, coming internal, um, looking on the inside instead of always externally. And I think we're going to find some really beautiful pieces to incorporate into our new emergence on the other side. Anything for you there, Liz, any of your links? Um, just some mindfulness, a mindfulness link, and then Biurnal Beats has a, a series of different um, videos that you can listen to on on YouTube. They're kind of these atonal uh, brain balancing for different for different um, states of mind. And then the next slide, I put a bunch of apps that are about. Um, resilience, calm, and headspace are ones that I know really well. Heart math, um, you might have your own, but there's so many apps that can kind of help us to get into that uh, transcendent space where we're just floating along and we're really feeling calm. I know a lot of people right now are very anxious, and so these I put these there to just kind of remind us that there are things we can do. Thank you so much, Liz. I'm also, you know, for the mindfulness meditation link too. I'm sorry I didn't get my mindfulness meditation for kids up, but I'll post that afterwards. And it's something I'm sending to many parents right now. Just get your kids meditating, get them calm, get them, get them able to sit with themselves too. And then I just saw this link from Chris Kresser um, of books. And uh, there's books on resiliency. So um, John Kabat-Zinn, who really brought mindfulness mindfulness to the West in the way that it is. Pema Chodron, who's so amazing. Um, Rick Hansen, I know less. Um, and I don't know Darlene Cohn at all. But these all sound like kind of good resources. And then just for fun, I put one of my favorite um, things from the Carol Burnett show. And then um, a song called My Corona, um, sent, sung to the tune of My Sharona. So um, <laughs> just some goofy things. So get us laughing. Is that what you're saying? We need to yes. laugh and smile as well. Yes. Yep. I agree. I think we're going to have to watch that video tonight with the kids. That looks like fun. 
Oh, it's so fun. The, the Carol Burnett one is just so fun. Um, and then a few food and immune. So um, both Paula and I saw this video by Dr. Um, Jeffrey Van Wingen about kind of how do you treat your groceries when you come in from the store and how can you reduce uh, your exposure? And I have to say, I'm not doing all of it, but, um, but he's a surgeon. He's like, how do we bring surgical procedures into your kitchen? And the one thing that I learned was I'm lucky enough to have a garage and um, it's still a little cool in there. And so one of the things he said was putting things in your garage for a few days will probably kill what's ever on them. So we're doing a lot of that. And then um, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald, um, who is a friend and colleague, um, she has a wonderful immune essentials broth. And then Tatis Karazian, another amazing, brilliant um, man, um, has uh, some interesting stuff on building immunity. So, you know, just more resources from people who are, who know what they're talking about. Um, nobody, as I said before, nobody really knows this particular virus, but people know a lot about the immune system in general and about other viruses. So, um, you know, don't believe everything you read on Facebook <laughs> or anything. A friend just the other day sent, sent me something that said, do you know that just drinking three cups of black tea will, will protect you and cure you from COVID-19? And I'm like, no, it won't. You know, because uh, in one minute I could find references that disputes that. So she's the same person who said, oh, you could kill it by using a hairdryer up your nose. So I wonder about <laughs> her level of intelligence right now, but... But other than that, you know, you want to have really good resources and don't believe everything that your even a good friend tells you. Yeah. One other thing I'll add to this list in that in terms of a food and immune resources that we didn't talk about really is hydration and the importance of, of keeping ourselves moist in this time. Our environments too, you know, it's still cold here at night, so I'm running a wood stove. So I always have a, a pot of water on the top of it to keep the house at a good, um, at a good moisture level, as well as myself. Um, I set up a hydration station first thing in the morning. I put on a big pot of tea, so it's at least a quart, sometimes a two quart mixed tea, and I use a lot of different blends of teas that I was going to talk about today, but I'll put those um, up in a in a after link as well for this. But I'll put up a pitcher pitcher of water at home and bring in a pitcher of water at work as well, and then I know exactly what I'm drinking of a day. And I can you know when it's not hot out and I'm not outside, I don't generate thirst in the same way that I do in the morning. So having a hydration station. For anybody that comes through my house, it's like, want a drink? It's, a re it's a, just a great reminder. So I'm getting the, I'm getting the extra so respiratory, yeah, the immune and the respiratory herbs, the, the calming herbs, the immune enhancing herbs, the, um, the nourishing herbs. There's so much that we can add to our nutrient density by bringing that in. And then I just, and we have gathered some more, right. just some more um, really good resources. Of course, you know, CDC, American Nutrition Association, University of Arizona Integrative Medicine, Consumer Labs, Deanna Minnick and Metagenics. Um, and then at Cornell, they have another COVID, uh, he gave a lecture on empowering and protecting your family. So, you know, good resources. Um, Maybe you're tired of looking at all this stuff, but just in case you still want more, there's plenty out there. All right, this was a piece that was shared by one of our graduates and it really spoke to me. And I need to clarify this was not written by her. It's really from an anonymous author, but they're just, very moving and important questions that I ask myself each day. What am I grateful for? Who am I checking in on and connecting with today? First of all, is it with myself? What expectations of normal am I letting go of today? 
How am I moving my body today? And ultimately, what beauty am I creating, cultivating, and inviting in today? I find questions so important in my life. They take me deep. They help me explore my inner landscape, answer many questions on my own. <laughs> Do you feel and I think that's important right now, Paula, because we are so on our own right now. And it's one time, probably potentially in a lifetime, that we'll have to really focus in on us. Yeah. We have this time. I, I do believe it's a gift. I believe it's a gift, too. I think it's a very, one of the best gifts we could have gotten, this pause. We have some comments um, from our audience. Wants to thank you, Dr. Lipsky, for your work. I've countlessly referred to digestive wellness for my patients and re recommended the purchase for many patients and friends. Thank you. Oh, hurrah. Thank you, Bianca, for your service. Thank you, Paula. She's also encouraging, uplifting music and um, saying that the, 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 the link works. Thank you for... Oh, you know, what Stacy sharing, she said, yes, for sure, this is a test run. It has been working OR, ER, triage, and screening. So thank you for supporting nurses across the country. Stay calm. Do not absorb all the information from the news, as Paula says. Stay calm. Stay centered. Oh, yeah. Love this, Liz. From my yard. This is some of my meditation. I garden. I take pictures. It just makes me happy. I've been, been listening to biurnal beats since this period um, of time. And Perspective is an amazing journal app that allows you to log your daily moods and interests. All right. All right. Liz and Bianca, do you feel calmer for this? <laughs> I do. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Liz. Thank and you. Thanks all. for everyone for joining us today. It's, it's really nice to, to be together. I have some closing comments that I'll share. Um, questions been asked about will this um, was this recorded? Yes, all the slides will be available. This recording will be up on our website in just a few days. All the slides, all the links, everything will be there. Everything that I've said that I'll add to it. I will include as well. Um, there's a survey that comes up after, right as this webinar ends, and I'd really, we all, the three of us would really appreciate your feedback, how this served you, um, and I encourage you, please share it broadly. Send people to our website to, to listen to this, to avail themselves of these resources too. It's a way that you can be supportive of others during this time. We've also posted a number of articles to uh, Hawthorne's Facebook page and our blog, so you can check those out as well. Um, what's coming up next? We're carrying on here at Hawthorne. Our next webinar is on May 5th when we host Glenn Depke. He's a Hawthorne faculty advisor, and he's going to be presenting on mitro mitochondrial health during this time. And our next All About Alumni, this is a special segment that I get to do where I interview our graduates once a month so that they can talk about their experience at Hawthorne and really their post-grad activities, their accomplishments, their challenges, their future goals. They're just beautiful, amazing, and so inspiring and motivating. So on Wednesday, May 6th at noon, I get to interview our doctoral program graduate, Nishanga Bliss. And she's going to be talking a lot about what she's been doing, and I'm really looking forward to that. And Liz is smiling especially because Liz was the education director of Hawthorne University a number of years ago when Nishanga was going through the doctoral program. Right, Liz? Yeah, she is a bundle of light. She is a bundle of light. So I'm looking forward to that too. All right. This concludes our share at this time. Just thank you so much, Liz and Bianca. I want to thank everybody thank for sharing you. this experience with us. It was really important and meaningful to me to have this time with you. I want to wish you all the best of health. 
I look forward to learning more together with you at Hawthorne University in our webinars and our All About Alumni series. And until then, I'm going to continue to tend my health and joy and compassion and kindness because you know what we practice grows stronger. So I hope you'll join me in this too. Until we meet again, and I trust we will, be well, take good care. It matters now so much.